Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, the 31st of October. Today's topic is our featured teacher for October, Marcy Hebert. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, and Tammy Moore. Thank you to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. I'm actually going to turn the mic over to Paula Noggle, who will now introduce Marcy and ask the newbie question. Paula, we're not hearing you. Um, have you clicked on the talk button? Um, good morning, everyone. <laughs> I Woo <-hoo>, good morning. <laughs> I am suffering from a bad case of medicine head. I have been under the weather. In fact, I just got my voice back late yesterday. So I'm excited that I can at least introduce Marcy. And I'm sorry, I'm just talking away, forgetting to click on talk. So let me get that started again. Okay, I am so thrilled to be here today to introduce my great friend and travel buddy, Marcy Bear, to all of you today. Marcy and I have been friends for several years, and we travel around Louisiana and the United States, attending conferences, ed camps, and Google summits. And sometimes we even present together. I have enjoyed watching Marcy soar is she continually pushes herself to accept new challenges. She uses social media such as Twitter, Boxer, Periscope, Google Plus, and more to connect with and learn from others and to share what she and her students are doing. Marcy is the technical director and computer teacher for the St. Joan of Arc School in Laplace, Louisiana, which is um, near New Orleans. She um, calls herself a tech geek, a maker. She is a wife, mom, and co-founder of LA Ed Chat. And um, she's one of the moderators for the GEG Louisiana. She is one of the co-organizers for Ed Camp NOLA. And she is also a Google for Education certified trainer. So uh, without further ado, because I could go on and on and on about Marcy, but I want to give her as many minutes as possible to share all of her wonderful featured teacher presentation with you today. So Marcy, what does Classroom 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Class Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Join me now in welcoming Marcy. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Paula. It really means a lot that you get to introduce me because you've been a big part of this journey for me. Web 2.0 means that no longer am I alone in my classroom. No longer are my students doing things just for me. They're doing things to show the world what they've learned and what they're capable of. And so Web 2.0 has been a big part of my journey to where I am today as a teacher and um, as a person probably, too. So you'll see it as a big piece of what I've been doing the past few years. So I've got it labeled Makerspaces, my journey. Um, there's been a long kind of crazy route to get here, but it's been an amazing ride, and I've had great people alongside me as I've done this. So a little bit about me. Um, she, Paula talked about Ed Camp NOLA, and there she is with me as one of the organizers. Um, I have put a few of the chats, because the Common Core State Standards chat was one of the first Twitter chats where I actively jumped in. I was that person who I, was, I had a Twitter account, but I didn't truly see where to go with it for a very long time. And when I started jumping in and engaging with people in chat, it changed things for me. The picture on the top left is the, a gentleman by the name of Marlon Ng. He is from Hong Kong, um, the American International School of Hong Kong. He and I had started doing some collaborative projects that grew out of a simple chat that he was one of the moderators for, for Common Core State Standards. Um, another group of my buddies are the Catholic Ed Chat crew, so I think there are a few of you in here, so hello, everybody. Um, they've become a group that I have learned with, grown with, and they've pushed me to get out of my comfort zone and try new things. I've been going around presenting, um, been an interesting journey. 
There are some of you sitting listening today that think I probably couldn't do that. And I would tell you that if you said that to me two years ago, I would have agreed with you. But it's amazing that each of us has great things to share and learn from each other. And so I hope you'll consider that down the road if you're not doing it now. And Louisiana EdChat um, has been another great group of my friends. And along this journey, I've worked to earn my Google Certified Trainer, which has been another great ride for me. So I'll start off with this definition that I like. For those of you who aren't as familiar, um, Diana Alrandina says that a makerspace is a place where students can gather to create, invent, tinker, explore, and discover using a variety of tools and materials. That's a great definition because I don't want a makerspace to be heavily, heavily defined. It's whatever you make it. It's whatever you allow. Um, my journey with Makerspaces started at ISTE 2013, my first ever ISTE, where I had a great friend like Paula to kind of help me along as a newbie. And I sat on the floor of the convention center, and I had these amazing deep conversations with teachers who got it. And so for the first time, it was like, wow, listen to these people and what they're doing, and they're really stepping out and doing these great things. And that inspired me. Then I wandered around the show floor, and if you've never been to ISTE, that's an extremely overwhelming experience. But I stood and I watched this 3D printer, and I was amazed by the possibilities. I mean, what could my students and I do if we had something like that? And so I went home going, all right, I saw robots, things kids were programming, and I thought, we could do that. And so those ideas, that first ISTE, all started to roam around in my head. I started reading the book Invent to Learn. It's in the link. If you want to get into any form of making, Invent to Learn is a great place to start. And so I started reading that and kind of letting the ideas roam around in my head. And the other thing you need to know is for me, Google is not, yes, I'm totally a Google girl, obviously. But Google needs to happen in the background because in the midst of all this new exploring, the kids were learning how to use Google tools, and we were making that a part of our daily repertoire, but not the focus. I don't want my kids' focus to be, we know how to use this tool. I want them to use the tool to do something productive. And so that's how Google has been a part of my background. When I went to ISTE 2014, I was terribly excited because my boss had allowed me to fund a 3D printer, and my printer arrived right before I left for ISTE. And so I got to go to a session and I sat with these two great ladies. The one on the right is a teacher at my school, and the one on the left is another teacher from New Orleans. And we went to the Hummingbird Robotics drop-in. And the three of us sat, I believe it was two and a half hours, when we realized the time had flown by. And we built a robot right there on the spot from a table of craft supplies. We hooked it up, we programmed it, and we had a blast. And we, we fumbled our way through it. I can honestly say that. We don't always know the answers, but we figured them out. And that was the power of it, is giving the kids the same chance as we had to figure it out. I also got to go to a, an Invent to Learn workshop with Gary Sager and Sylvia Martinez, which was amazing. While I was there, I got to play with things I was never played with. Um, if you knew my mother, she's an amazing seamstress. I can't sew a stitch. But here I was sewing, and here I was hooking up electronics through cardboard and through uh, with batteries and circuits and circuit tape and all these other toys that I'd never been exposed to. I'm the tech willing one at my school. I'm always willing to try something new. The teacher with me was a little more nervous. And that morning, her face had this, why do you have me here look. And as we started playing with these things, her eyeballs lit up. And it was like, I get it. I see what I can do with these things for my kids. And that was powerful for me to see that in another teacher. We played with the batteries, we played with the circuits, which, by the way, she now uses with her kids in her classroom. I saw people walking around with all these cool 3D printed things, and I was like, I'm going to learn how to do that. And so I come back, and I know that it's time for change, and not just a physical change of the room, but a change of how are we going to approach things. So I started off the year by teaching the kids these things. This is what my kids usually look at me like when I give them a project. They give me this confused or, oh, my God, face, like, really, you want me to do that? I can tell you that this face has disappeared from my classroom. They come eager. They want to be there. They want to try things. To do that, we went over some basic rules, and I love this quote by Steven Anderson. Live your life in beta. Give yourself permission to take risks, fail, and challenge the norm. In my classroom, it's become the new normal to try something, even if you're not sure if it'll work, to fail and then go, okay, 
How do I fix this? How do I move on? Can I just make a tweak and change it, or am I going to have to rethink my approach to this problem? And that, I needed this permission from my boss. So those of you here who are administrators or looking at administrative tracks, give your teachers the chance to make mistakes. I went to my principal and I said, I'm going to totally change what I do in my classroom. I don't know how it's going to work yet. I need you to trust that I've spent a lot of time planning, I've spent a lot of time thinking this through, and I'm going in. And I'll make adjustments as I go. The other thing is we believe a fail is a first attempt in learning. I have to give grades. I wish I could say I didn't. But your grade in my class is not tied to did you finish it and it was perfect, especially the first time, but what did you learn? What did you learn in the process? So we started off with 3D printing, and the picture is us setting it up. Um, a friend of mine who helps me with the network, his son was so excited by the 3D printer, he offered to learn it and teach me. But what we ended up doing was working together to load it and practice with it. And so the first thing we did was printed off this little piece that's built into it. I stood for 45 minutes with my mouth hanging open, just watching this machine go and marveling at what it could do. From there, I had to decide how did I want my kids to use this machine? Because one of my pet peeves is just to do the same old, same old. I didn't want it to just become a manufacturing station for phone cases and bracelets and all those things. And so how was I going to take this new technology and bring it into my room? And so it's one of the, the projects my kids rotate through. And the first few kids, we really didn't do a great job with that. The first print, here he is, this little guy Bryce, he made his own set of Legos. And you'll notice there's a little bit of a gap in his Lego on the right. Um, and that little gap is because, it's kind of right in here, that little gap is simply because he didn't have the Lego facing the right way after he manufactured it. And I know when you look at the left picture and you think, surely she staged that. Actually, I was coming across the room and he stood there the entire class while I started the print and watched it. So then we move deeper into this idea of, okay, the Lego's neat and I'm still learning the machine, so are you. But I asked the kids to start working on solving a problem in their life. I didn't ask them to change the world, but what I asked them was, think about things in your life that annoy you. Can you come up with a way to fix that problem? And as you'll see in the next few, some of them did better than others with that. This is a little girl named Ebony. This is one of my favorite projects because this was one of our early projects and probably the first one that did a really great job at solving her problem. Her problem, she told me, was that every morning she had to fight with her cords for her hair dryer and her flat iron and all of those things. And I said, okay, so what are you going to do about it? And she said, I'm going to design something to hold my hair dryer. And I said, okay, I'm good with that. Go for it. And so you see on the top what she printed. One of the things that she and I talked about was if she takes this bar and stretches it and makes a second, or actually be a third version, she made a third version, she could even stretch it far enough and drop her hot iron over it, her flat iron, and that could cool. What she did was on this back side, she put a piece of command adhesive strip and hooked it to, I think it was either the wall or the cabinet in her house. I make the kids prove to me that it works. And so she brought it and she proved that her project that I asked her to do did indeed work. Another kiddo, and this is a perfect example of the fact that they fail a lot in my room. This child took three iterations to get her project done. Here's her initial plan, and what she told me was, this is a little girl who's very quiet. She reads. Every time she comes to my classroom, she had a book in her hand, because we would, you know, the rule was you have to show me what you're reading, and we'll see if it's, you know, something we can talk about. And so I let her go with this. She said she wanted something that would hold her books she was reading and a, a little place to keep her pens. And I was like, okay, I'll let you do that. That fits you. So this is the first one she did, and what you need to know is it was maybe two to three inches tall. And I printed it off, and I was new at this, so I hadn't totally gotten measurements and stuff. I looked at the design. It looked good. I printed it. I let it print, and I took it off the machine, and I brought it to her in another classroom, and I said, is this what you meant for it to do? And she looked at me with very wide eyes, and she said, no, that's not what I wanted. And I went, okay, gotcha. So let's see how we fix it. So this was her second iteration. And the problem was, it's lovely sitting here on my printer. When I went to take it off of the printer one morning when it was finished, I snapped part of this back wall. And so I went to her and I was kind of like, oh my gosh, I'm very sorry I broke it. But let's look at this as a learning opportunity. I said, what would you do here? 
And she looked at me and she said, yeah, I need to fix that. I said, yeah, because if you put a book here and I could snap it just trying to get it off, then there's a good chance that it'll break. And so you see here the third version. So it took her three rounds. And while it wasn't the biggest problem, it still taught her the process of going through and fixing her mistakes, which was amazing. We made a lot of mistakes. This was us not knowing about supports, which is something to turn on that when something's not perfectly flat or there's empty spaces. And it printed really well until it got to a certain point, and then I found all this extra little squirrely stuff around the printer. So as a teacher, I had to shift my mindset a lot and be willing to just go with the mistakes and move on from them. This one is one of the kids who told me that they wanted to design a better way to keep their headphones, which I know that's always a running thing for many of us. And so she made this little bar, and she made the little snaps to pop in the top, and she made her headphone holders. She did end up going back and making this a little thicker because there was concern later about her snapping it. Um, this one is really cool. This is one of my little girls, and she ended up trying to use this for her science fair project because what she did, her father is into speakers, and she works with her dad on speakers. So she told me she wanted to know if there was a difference between a round head on a speaker and a square head on a speaker. It took her about three times to get the sizing right. The first time, hers were also super tiny. Then she also had to work on getting these pieces big enough that she could put wires in and run them up. And what she did was she wanted to use it as a social studies fair project, but it was a situation where one parent said yes and the other said no, and it was two households. But she did end up playing with them and continuing to work to wire them because she was so intrigued with it. This one is one of my fifth graders. And he told me, Miss Bear, you know, I do a lot of time in the car with my family, and I'm always looking for something to do, and my mom doesn't always want me on my devices. And he said, I love to play tic-tac-toe, but it becomes a pain because you've got to have paper and all these things. So he said, can I make a portable tic-tac-toe board? And I said, sounds good to me. I, I can go with that. And so this is the one he made. He keeps it in a Ziploc bag in the car now, and so he has a place to play or something to play with and can just sit it on the seat and play or take it out when he's somewhere else. Sometimes the kids are way smarter at processing than we are because when he first showed me the design on the computer, I was like, um, you have an extra X up here. And he's like, yeah, Miss Bear, I need four of each. So there you go. The teacher's not always the smartest in the room. This is one of my little sixth graders. And what he wanted was something designed to hold the two controllers for his PlayStation. Now, I'm kind of tough on them. If they can convince me sometimes, I will reverse my ruling on whether they can do a particular project because we talk them through. And I kept saying, surely there's something to hang it on the wall out there. And he said, Ms. Bear, I've looked. So he and I sat next to each other, and we did a Google image search. And sure enough, we didn't find any. And so you can see the excitement on his face when he brought it and showed that it really did work to hold them. And so now he has it hanging on the wall by his um, system for him and his brother to keep their controllers. This is one that she was in fifth grade last year when she finished this project. This is one of my little girls who's generally very shy, very quiet, says very little in class. She's very into art. So she wanted to design her own palette that would meet her needs. So I said, okay, I'll go with that for you. This is her face when I brought it to her. I stopped in another classroom and brought it to her when it came off of the printer. And I got the biggest smile I think I've ever seen from her face in the three years I've been teaching her. And this is one from this year. This little girl plays the flute. And she told me that her problem was that when she's home practicing, she doesn't have a music stand, and her flute rolls and falls. And so she said, can I design something to hold my flute on the table while it's put together, and I need to put it down when I'm practicing? And so you can see we use, um, we use Tinkercad.com, which is free um, 3D design software. And then we bring it into the software. We have a MakerBot printer. And then this is her with her finished design. She did a great job. They're getting better at measurements. We do a lot with, um, I don't answer questions a lot. I ask questions to get them to come up with answers. So a lot of them have gotten very good at using Google to convert since we Americans are not so metric system. This little girl is coming. Her mother's always mad at her in the morning because she's always running late and she can't find her brush and her mom's fussing. So she designed something to hook to the mirror in her bathroom to hold her brush so that every morning now she just grabs her brush right off the mirror and can brush her hair and she's not running so late getting ready for school. One of the other projects we started to play with were the Hummingbird Robotics Kit. This kit uses a board that does have an Arduino at its baseline, 
But what it allows the kids to do is use sensors and lights and motors and all kind of things to build robots. And this is one of the other projects that I saw at the um, first ISTE that I went to. And so my kids have done all kind of things. We have a lot of cardboard. Cardboard's all over in schools. So everybody on campus now knows that when you have extra boxes and cardboard, they go to Marcy's room. And so this was two of my eighth graders worked together to build a working basketball goal that when it went through, it would light up and it made a noise. They had a lot of trouble doing this one because at first they had this sensor sitting like up here. And I said, that's great, but I could throw and miss it and it could miss, couldn't it? And they're like, oh. So they really had to work to rearrange it, build it, and make it work. Um, it uses a very basic visual programming, and there are other ones that you can use with the hummingbird kit. A lot of them build little animals and critters that sing, talk, play music, and light up. This one was really cool. Um, you probably noticed the pictures are a bit darker than most because what they did, this sensor detects light and dark. And so what they did is when the lights went off in the classroom, the lights would flash back and forth and the front lights would turn on. They were very proud, and we have drug abuse resistance education, or DARE, still goes on where we live. And so they were so excited to show it to the DARE officer who would sometimes come into my classroom to see the kids. And so they were tickled that it worked. I have to say, too, it's not uncommon to hear things in my classroom like, hang on, everybody, we're turning out the lights for a minute. And they do that to test their machines and make them work. So my room is a chaotic place, and that's something I, as a teacher, had to learn to just embrace and go with it. This one was a volcano. The kids originally came up with the plan of a volcano, and they asked me, could they go to the art teacher and see if he would let them do all of the painting and work on their volcano? So I said, absolutely. Here's a note, bring it, get him to sign it. And so for a couple of days, they'd come check in with me at the start of class, and they'd go to his room, and they would turn the volcano that they built. They built it out of foam and packing tape, because we keep all kind of supplies in the room. And then they took it to his lab and painted it, and then brought it back and wired it up. This one also was a light sensor. So when the lights in the classroom went out, the volcano would light up, and they put a vibration motor in it so that it did like a slight rumble to emulate a volcano. This one was a cute little rabbit. He had a motion sensor in his, that was his nose, and so when you came close, he lit up. This was a fifth grade project. Um, this one, I put the arrow because they called him Puppy, even though he looks, I don't know, more like an alligator, I guess, when you're from Louisiana. But in the top of his head, what would happen is when you ran your hand over it, there was a motion sensor. So they treated it like when you petted the dog, his eyes would light up and he would bark. We also have a station using coding, Lightbot app. So here's like your great tip. In the first week of December, I believe, is the hour of coding. Right around that time, there are often a lot of apps that will go free or have a free version for hour of code. And Lightbot is one of those. It's a great app. We use it on our iPads in the room. And it allows the kids to kind of practice some of the theory behind coding and, and understanding it step by step in a cute little character and um, you can get it wrong and then go back and fix it type of environment. And so we are using the Lightbot 14 hour of code version. So the kids do that first and then they come into Scratch. Um, Scratch.mit.edu, and it's in the live finder links, is a great free place that kids are allowed to do visual coding. And so the kids do some things that are really simple but cool. I remember, I'm going to show my age now, the little game called Simon when we were kids, where you had to follow the pattern of colors. She made a Simon game with a pattern of colors, and it would tell you when you were right. This little guy is into racing games, so he made his own little racing game. One of the things it had to do was have a clear ability to have to restart because you quote unquote lost on a game like this or tell that it won. And you can see his little start line. Another thing that I fell in love with, again, at ISC was little bits. You've never seen little bits. They're these electronic pieces, and they magnet together for the kids. But it lets them explore circuits and electricity and those kind of things and how it all works. So the kids have to go through their cards that came with the workshop kit we used. And those cards are then used for them to explore how each of them works. So I kind of almost had it set up as a science assignment where they have to, very generic, very open, because I'll try to be there as much as I can. But it'll say, okay, here's a button. 
build this circuit with the button that's on the card. And then I tell them, take some other stuff from the kit, build a circuit, take a picture of it, make a prediction. What do you think it'll do? Test it. If your prediction didn't work, fix it. And then once they finish that part, they get to come in and make something with it. So in this case, it had little arms that flipped around, and it had, I think this one had a light in its head. And you can see the pieces of the little bits back here behind it. Again, this was a little piece of plastic. Pool noodles and foam are one of my favorites. Um, the lady at the Dollar Tree thought I was crazy because I bought an entire box of pool noodles at the end of the summer for like a dollar a piece. And the kids know that they can cut those apart for anything that they're building. This little girl made an octopus, and it's a still picture, but his arms um, wiggled. And you can tell, again, that we use cardboard from different companies that we can get our hands on. You can see some of my messy pile, the hot glue gun in the background. He made a little guy that lit up, and one of the parts of his arm moved. This person made like a little sun, and part of it rotated and lit up. And again, you can see the circuit pieces coming behind it. They tape them in and then take them out. So that was my first year of kind of turning the lab into a makerspace. The kids still are responsible for computer type skills because they use Google Docs, slides, presentations, video, apps, iPads. So that part is the background of the other learning going on. In the midst of all of this, I had met Marlon about two years before in a chat. And Marlon and I started it off by doing a, um, we did Teach Like a Pirate, a global book study. By the way, folks, ask. Vapor Jeff was amazing because we tweeted him. He joined us live in two of our three discussions. Then last year what we did was we had the third graders at his school and the fourth graders at my school video blogging back and forth, teaching each other about the cultures. Amazing how when we think things are so different, they can be very similar. And so we've had an amazing time with that. So we did a session on making global connections for teachers and students last year. So this was still going on while I was in the midst of making the shift to the makerspace. This year we brought in some new toys. I call them toys. This is a Sphero. Um, I was very blessed that we have a lot of industries in the area we live in. And so I got a grant for $2,450 to bring some new equipment in this year. And one of those is Sphero. And if you don't know about Spiro, it's a little electronic ball. And what you're able to do is use the app to drive it or program it. So what I asked the kids to do was build an obstacle course. And you can see two of the kids, we work wherever we have space, because sometimes we're in the hall. And we were able to work, and the kids were able to build obstacle courses. They had to come up with a plan, draw it in Google Draw as a simple um, plan and discuss their plan, and then they have to build it. And then what they actually have to do is take the app Tickle, T-I-C-K-L-E, and they have to program it through the obstacle course. And in the links that you'll get a little later, I actually have some video of the kids working on theirs and talking one of the kids through when he demonstrated to me that it worked. By the way, I'm a mean teacher. For me, working in a program means that you have to be able to do it repeatedly. It's not a one time and it works. It has to be a fully working program. And so you can see we're here with the hot glue gun. They work on the floor. There's stuff all over my room. I will tell you that using the maker mentality and having kids build and construct was a release as far as the neatness of your classroom. I have piles of cardboard, foam. We have supplies. One of the things we've done this year is I brought in little bins to organize things even further because we were kind of a mess, and I had to, had to make some peace with the mess but I also had to organize the mess. And so this little guy sat and worked on this thing. He ended up having to shift some parts of it because he didn't like the way they worked. And this is another group. This is a classroom next door that sometimes we can find a few minutes empty, and so my boss lets me spread kids out wherever we can. You can see the pool noodles that she cut as little things to go around. Each child had very different concepts of what their obstacle course should look like, and they were allowed to take that and run with it. So this past week, a kid said this to me, and I thought, how powerful. I woke up and thought, man, I have to go to school. Then I realized I had seventh period computer, and I couldn't wait to do my Sphero obstacle course because it's so much fun. On one level, that bothers me because I don't like when our kids don't want to go to school. 
because it's not fun or they don't feel like they're being challenged in learning. But on the other level, to hear a kid say that what we're doing is powerful enough to get her to go, wait, never mind, I do want to go to school today. That's, that's really important. And these kids have had to come through this work and they've had to find it. If you're in my classroom and you ask a question, the answer usually comes back to you as a question. The kids are asked to do research. The kids are asked to use the internet. The kids are asked to use YouTube to find out how. I don't teach them how to do it. Even with the robotics kits, I give them the link to the website and I simply say, here's the stuff, go ahead and figure it out. And I've gotten, well, but it doesn't work yet. Well, what can you do to make it work? My own child was in my class last year and he would get in the car in the evening and he would say, um, mom, we're having trouble with our robot because, and I go, okay, pause. You see how you said mom? Keyword there. I'm not going to answer that question. And his answer was always, but mom, you won't answer in class. And I said, but do I answer the others in class or do I force you to work on finding the answer? And he said, will you work on having us find the answer? So for a kid to say that makes my day because that's the kind of learning experience I want for all kids. We also added Makey Makey. Now, the kit currently has different colored alligator clips. But it's a little bitty circuit board that you have to your computer and it has these little alligator clips. And it allows you to basically reprogram the things your keyboard on your machine does. And so the kids have been busy figuring out how to use it. This little guy created a controller with an index card, balls of paper. He alligator clipped it, and then he was able to play the game with it. And you can see we have glue sticks, paper, whatever we can find is a tool in my classroom. This little girl actually used her pencils. And you can see each of her pencils is actually hooked up to the alligator clips to play. Very quiet child, had the biggest smile on her face this day when she got it all working the way she wanted. And for me, that's the power. This little girl took plastic cups and she cut a little slit in them and put the alligator clips in and she was actually playing the Google Pac-Man game um, in the Google logo. And she was playing a little keyboard synthesizer. It's hard to tell, but she actually had some of the clips hooked to like her sweatshirt, her skirt, her hand. And so she was using those to play the piano. This little guy, no, this one, my little girl, was using um, Makey Makey, and she hooked it up and was using it to turn on some of the tools in Google Draw. She found some drawbacks, and she had to go back and rearrange her plan a bit. But she sat and drew it, thought it out, and made it work. And for me, that, that's always a win in my class. When I sat back, last year after my first year really making this huge shift and I thought about what was going well and what wasn't. One of the problems I had was that I don't think the kids got enough chance to see the others work because so many times they were so busy with their own. The other thing I always worried about too was getting them to think. I know they thought when they talked talk to me because I would ask questions and I could see their thinking, but I really wanted to push them a little deeper in the thinking process. And so a gentleman by the name of Ryan Reed, and this is his Twitter handle, I learned about he was doing these things called App Dice. And this is actually Pick Collage. It's an app. It's a free app, which is even better. And in it, I was able to pull a pattern for a 12-sided die and then just pull in the pictures of the apps I wanted the kids to use. And so what I did is I made this. I copied it. Um, I printed it on cardstock trimmed it out, laminated it, and then put it together as a die. And so now what the kids did first this year before we got into projects was they would roll the die, they would get an assigned app, and they were in small groups, and that group had to learn how to use the app and teach the rest of the class. I wasn't going to teach them. So if a group rolled ThingLink, they went and got the iPads. I had a login for them to use for ThingLink, and they were able to go build something as a sample, and then they had to get up and they had to present to the rest of the class and teach them how to use the app and show their sample. Once they got through that portion, what we do is about every two to three weeks, they roll the app die, they get their app, and what they have to do is keep track of the work they do during that period. And I have three basic questions they have to answer with the app. What did you do during this time period? What work did you accomplish? What was easy for you? What was hard for you? And then if they run into a problem that they think the class can help, since I rarely answer how to do something, 
then they can ask the class and kind of crowdsource the help. Because as adults, we crowdsource all the time. If you're here at Classroom 2.0 Live watching a webinar, you're going to other teachers looking for ideas, for inspiration, for help. I want our kids to understand that they can learn how to do something on their own. They don't need us to point and tell them step by step or go click here, click here, click here. And so it's been really cool to see them take that thinking and turn it into some sort of presentation. And then we're using Telegami, Adobe Voice. We have a swivel cam, and I'll talk about that one in a minute. We're using Google Docs, Explain Everything, Google Drawing, Hit Collage, Thing Link. Erasmus we're going to use, but we're having some issues with it. One of the updates on our iPads, it no longer works, so we've had to re-roll. Google Slides, Periscope, and I'm missing one because this is when I was building it, and I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. Um, but we're using each of those as ways for kids to share their learning. So this is just a quick picture of two of the kids in the front, and he's using the iPad, and he has it shared to our screen. And they are teaching the kids instead of me. And I mentioned the swivel cam. Right here is a swivel cam. And what it does is it allows you to hook in an iPad, an iPhone. You can even buy adapters for digital cameras. And it has a little microphone. And it allows you with that microphone, it also has a sensor where the camera dock, the little base station, will actually follow you and tilt, and it'll swivel around. So it becomes your recording person. The kids use the swivel cam to record their reflections. I kind of have joked that it looks like a confessional video sometimes because, you know, you see a little bit of the ceiling and you see one or two little faces depending on how many of them are on the project. But it's been really powerful for me to hand a new piece of equipment to the kids and say, figure out how to use it and then teach us because they learn faster than I did. There we go. I bring up Periscope because if you don't know Periscope and you use Twitter, Periscope has been an amazing extension for classrooms. What it does is it ties to your Twitter account, and it allows you to live stream video. And so we live stream video from our classroom. So sometimes when I'm just walking around talking to the kids, checking in on them and their projects, I'll just carry my phone, because obviously it's blocked at school, but I can do it from my cell phone. And we do have signed releases that the parents allow us to use video and pictures and all that good stuff. So I will walk around, and I, you see me talking to the kids. You see their projects. You see conversations. Some of the video links I'm going to share with you, there's one or two. The quality wasn't perfect that day because of the reception. But it was authentic of what was going on in my classroom at that moment and the discussion as a child tested their work. So where are we headed next, coming soon? Minecraft is my next baby. Part of the grant I got was 30 licenses for Minecraft EDU. And so I got to go last year to a friend's school in California to part of the Minecraft EDU gaming tour for teachers and learn about Minecraft EDU. I have to be honest, I'm going completely out of my comfort zone at this point. I am not a gamer. I do not like gaming. But I see the potential for kids. Um, under the grant, we're going to be having our sixth graders take the characters and settings from their novel. And they're going to build them in Minecraft. And then there's a mod that you can add that allows you to get things out of Minecraft as a 3D printer file. And so the kids are actually going to build those in Minecraft and take them to the 3D printer. And so they will actually have physical representations of characters and or settings that they did from a novel. The other thing I'm totally excited about, and Paul, I don't know if you know yet, but my boss has approved it and it's already ordered. Um, we are getting a breakout EDU kit. And if you go to breakoutedu.com, and they also have a Facebook group, what it is is the breakout game. And these are going on around the country where they're locking adults in a room, and they have so long to solve the problem and get out. Well, as teachers, locking kids in a room is never a grand idea. And so what they've done is they've created this kit, and there are different types of locks. There are directional word numbers. There are clues in the room. It uses a black light. It uses flashlights. My goal with this will be not just to play the breakout EDU games with the kids, but also to work on having some of my kids maybe write some of the games. There are some teachers and kids in the country right now that are starting to write games. And so that's where I hope to head with breakout EDU. Um, Google Cardboard is, I saw somebody incorporated a cardboard into a breakout EDU. This is my own son at home playing with my, my set of Google Cardboard. It's a really cool virtual reality. 
Um, some people are building their own. I went on the cheap. I think I ordered this one for about 15 bucks. And it lets you feel like you are somewhere. When you look all the way up and all the way down and 360 degrees around, it allows you to be in that world. And they have things in other countries. You can stand under the Eiffel Tower. You can be in a museum and look at a dinosaur. You can be in a hangar and standing next to one of the space shuttles. There's a lot of amazing content, and I think down the road this has the potential to give us more content. And the other big cool thing I'm looking forward to is I actually will be visiting Hong Kong in the spring to go work with some of the teachers at the American International School. We are working on firming up all of the details. Um, but I will get to go and spend four days at the American International School sharing some of the projects I've done, the makerspace concept, and some Google stuff. And the next thing we've got to deal with is the space issue. I took this picture standing on a chair, and this was one of my smallest classes, but there are days kids are tucked under tables, along the floor, in the hall next door. So what we are working to do now is eventually come up with a space that will allow us to work like we want. I've looked at different types of furniture, including the node chairs, and I think what I've actually come up with is a hybrid plan. Um, I kind of fell in love with some stuff by a company called Steel Case. I'm sorry, Smith Systems is the one I fell in love with. And so I have a design for my lab. This is actually to scale, and we are working now to, we have one grant that we've applied for, um, and I know big grants are long shots. But we're going to be continuing to work to find some funding to really make this a flexible space with tables that can stand or sit, fold and push, and all kind of flexible space in the room so that the kids can actually use the space in a better way as far as the physical space. Because right now we've taken a traditional computer lab and we've kind of made it our own version of a maker space. And so with that said, I'm going to turn over the questions. And I'm sure there's a ton going on in chat. I did push it to the side so I wouldn't be like the little ADD kid. Thanks so much, Marcy. I did capture some questions. Awesome. OK. I think <laughs> it was for the ISTE 2015. Uh, did you print your badge using the 3D printer? I printed the little one that said at Mrs. M. A. Bear, and I mm -hmm. typically wear it at conferences. Um, okay. Yeah, I made that. I, I, I won't lie. I, I stole that idea from Nathan Stevens, um, the king of glitter snark. Okay. And if you have a Symbaloo, um, I don't know the answer, Peggy, about the Symbaloo and Symbaloo EDU account. I'm not sure. Okay, somebody said they're just logged into Symbolu. And I'll go check my settings in a little bit and see what I can do if, if I need to change something. Um, yes, the breakout kits are still right at 100. If you want to do it a little bit cheaper yourself, one of the things that I thought was really impressive is they actually give you a link to, links to Amazon on where you can buy all the pieces minus the box that they make. Um, I have to say, I played Breakout EDU for the first time a few weeks ago. We hosted a room at, um, at Camp Nola. One of the gentlemen in our group did that, and it was so much fun. Um, we lost. I'm ashamed to say that. I was very angry at myself for missing something. And we are actually going to be doing Breakout EDU at our state Q conference. There's a group of us that will be staffing it, and every time there's a concurrent session, there will be a Breakout EDU game available. So it's, it's a new toy to take and try to leverage what kids can come up with and think. They're probably going to be better at building games than I am, and I'm okay with that because then I learn from them. Google Cardboard. Carolyn, I don't know of a store where you can try it out. The apps are on your smartphones generally, and they're free. But I, thought, I, went, to, I went this summer, and I, believe it or not, I Googled Google Cardboard and I found one of the cheaper pairs. The big thing if you're looking at it is just to make sure that you buy one that fits the particular device. I've seen them for about 12 or $13, and I mean, they can go up. Some people are designing them with like headbands, and they've kind of gotten pretty crazy with what they're doing. But I have just a simple little pair that's literally made out of cardboard. You found all the questions I gathered, Marcy. So again, <laughs> Thank you. 
uh, you just went right through them like I was going to. So, are there any other any others from RC? Any other questions? Or does anyone want to take the mic and tell us about your experiences? Okay, Paula, go ahead. Hi, Marcy. That was fantastic. Awesome, as always. And um, so inspiring to see how much you've done in um, just a couple of years. Um, would you share some of your stories with how the students react to the fact that you're basically doing um, your maker space as a hands off from the teacher aspect? And you know, what do they do as far as getting over their frustration level? Because I find my kids always want me to answer the questions for them, and I know that you don't want to do that. Yeah, and sometimes it's, it's staying strong in the face of they're not really happy with me. Um, you know, it's like they're like, ugh. Yeah, I've had kids, I think when you start is the hardest because they don't understand why you're doing it. And so you keep staying strong, keep staying strong. It's kind of like that parent moment when you have to just keep telling your child, I'm so sorry, but no. And then suddenly when one group or one kid finally gets over the hurdle and figures it out, suddenly they get why you're doing it. And it's like changing this, like their, their eyes open up and they understand it. Because I used to tease them. I was like, oh, I'm mean. I, I can't give you the answer. And like, they were finally like, it's not mean. It, we get it, Miss Bear. It's not an easy thing. Um, you know me, Paul. I kind of, as um, Emily Swinson says all the time, we, we fall forward. We jump in and we fall forward. And it's been just a process. And the kids have come to trust me in it. They understand, too, that I am not going to, be, you know, we're not going to belittle anybody who doesn't make it work. And really, I don't, I do have to give grades, but I don't base anything on how well it worked. It's how well did you work? Did you keep trying? Did you keep at it? The kids have also gotten quite adept at figuring out who helps them. And so, like, other kids will help. Um, as far as the parents worrying about the grades, they understood that, well, I put it in my, for lack of a better word, syllabus, that we're not going to have, I'm not a math class, I'm not a reading class, we're not going to have seven or eight grades. And so that, that them doing their work is really, really important. They have to try and they have to go at it. There are times kids don't finish. I rotate kids every nine weeks. So I have a group the first and the third nine weeks. And I have a different group on the second and fourth nine weeks. So their grade is based on, you know, how did you accomplish your work? And it might not even be how much you accomplished. Um, how, do, how many get bad grades? It's very rare. I also keep in touch with parents. If I see a child that's not doing, they're not putting the effort, that's my big issue. And then I get in touch with parents. I know, and I've, I've said this to parents, and some of you may gasp, and I'm sorry. I always tell parents, my goal when I walk into that classroom every day is not about the grade they get, but about the learning. And I can tell you that in just a year and a half of totally transforming my classroom, the kids get that they can figure things out, that they don't always need somebody to just tell them how to do it, because our kids wanted that. And I was guilty of being the, the person in the front of the room. I just, you know, would tell them, and I quit doing that. And it took some time to transition. But now they get where we're going, and they're having fun. Um, per year for materials, my printer, I put in the grant some materials since we're doing 3D printing. Um, the large spools are about 50 bucks a piece, and I went ahead and ordered eight for this year under the grant. So that's $400. The other thing I always tell people is I bought the warranty because there are still issues. Um, I'm not an expert at 3D printing. I've learned. I've taught myself. I've asked a lot of questions. I've screwed up a lot, too. But we've gotten it together, and we've worked through it together. And so it hasn't been tremendously expensive once you get past that initial investment. Um, and there are some new ones that have come out since I bought mine. There's one by, I think the company's name is Polar, P-O-L-A-R. And that one really has a lot of promise. I saw it this summer at ISTE, and I'm seeing people like Alice Keeler are using it. Yes, you can color and paint them. Um, 
we, my favorite is the Sharpie paint pen. That's what I used on the one that had my at Mrs. M.A. there. Um, wasting money with mistakes? No, Peggy. We make mistakes. I had a kid break something this week by accident. They were testing her first print. It, it finished, she finished it right at school, ended, I printed it this summer, and she picked up with it this year. And she looked devastated when I got to her about it being broken. And when I said, well, how'd you break it? And she told me that they were trying out two different size books because it's this little book holder thing she did. And I said, well, did you learn something about your design from your break? And she said, well, yeah, I did. Why? And I said, then that's all that matters. Um, we learn more sometimes from our mistakes than our successes in my classroom. And Sharon, I know it's time consuming. It's one of the things when I present about 3D printing, I tell people every time. It's extremely time consuming. But the confidence that kids have is amazing. Um, the, the process they've learned. You know, there's a lot of talk in education about grit and sticking to it and continuing to work through it even when it gets tough. And I think we've become such this throwaway society that everything is broken, just get a new one. And so for the kids to see that they can take something and fix it is amazing. Um, that has been such a process. And, and if anything, I know this is going to sound weird, but it's almost like my kids have grown more as people through this process than anything because they know that they can solve a problem, that they don't have to have somebody do it for them, that they can figure it out, and that they can go at it multiple times. And to me, those are the, the skills that we want our kids to have for life. And so that's really exciting. I happen to know a school about an hour from me that they are hoping to help a little girl who doesn't have a hand. Um, yeah, Paul, there are some people that talk about like melting it down, but right now I don't have a way to like melt it down and put it back into a spool. Um, however, we do hang on to the mistakes because we analyze them. I have a table with the mistakes. <laughs> um, but I, for me, the process and the getting to the end has been amazing. And um, this has been quite the ride and quite the journey. And Knowing what I know now about that journey, I'm not going to say every day was easy and the days they were upset with me because it wasn't going well and they didn't know what to do with it didn't feel great all the time. But being able to come back and see how they've grown has been awesome. Yeah, use it up, wear it out. Now, we do that with everything else. Anything somebody thinks we can use to build with now shows up in my classroom. I have one wall where we have like piles of cardboard and foam and tape and they send me all kind of stuff. We are now the um, recycling capital of our school. <laughs> Again, thanks so much, Marcy. That seems like a good note to start the wrap up for the show. So I think I'm going to turn this over to Peggy for this announcement. You sure are. And thank you so much, Marcy. That was so inspiring. And all those ideas just get the wheels turning and make us all want to get out there and create something. So thank you very much. And we're working on quite a few of our upcoming shows, but I'm very excited that next week's show is going to be done by a team of teachers from Madison School District right here in Phoenix, Arizona. And they're going to be sharing some of their experiences with digital assessment tools, including Kahoot, Socrative, Clickers, Google Forms, and Answer Garden. So if those sound interesting to you, I hope that you'll come back and join us next week. And then <clears throat> be sure to check our calendar for upcoming shows. Um, and as they get confirmed, I add them to that calendar. And that's right there on a tab on our website. And also, if you haven't subscribed to Classroom 2.0, Ning, that is hosted by Steve Hargadon, that's a different site than our site. But it's the place where you can subscribe to the weekly newsletters. And you'll get our notification about every upcoming webinar on Friday, the day before the webinar. So that's another good reminder and good way to keep track of that. We don't have our own mailing list, so you have to go to the Classroom 2.0 Ning to be 
be able to sign up for the newsletter there. And also, want to just remind everyone, it is the end of Connected Educator Month, but there are still tons and tons of fabulous resources and opportunities that are on their website. So be sure to go back and check it out. Maybe there was something that you thought would be interesting, but you just didn't have time to go to it. Go check it out, um, because many of them have now posted recordings of webinars or Google Hangouts, or they have links to websites and their own resources that they're using as a connected educator. So that site won't expire. You can keep going back. And back to you, Lori, as we wind it up. Thanks, Peggy. This is the Learning Revolution Project, which is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered together all of his PD resources in one place, including the Host Your Own Webinar series. You can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room for an event. As long as you make that event public, the room is free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link or in the resource tab of the Live Binder. We have a featured teacher every month, and Marcy was our featured teacher this month. When you exit the show, your browser should open the link to the survey for Classroom 2.0 Live. You can also get the form at this link or from the chat box or the tab in the Live Binder. At the bottom of the survey, you'll find fields to request a professional development certificate. And the, the field for your name will allow the, uh, you to get the certificate with your name actually printed on it. Please use a personal email address for this rather than a school email address. School email clients tend to block this. You don't usually get it through your, to your school email address. The audio and video collections are also available in iTunes U for the past shows, as well as an RSS feed. So there are many, many different ways to get re the recording links and to watch past shows. Again, special thanks to Marcy A. Bear, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teachers 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for a webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you so much for coming.